Biggest problem in America is not pain and suffering. The biggest problem is prosperity. Hey, it's Chip Bennett here with Reaching the Next Generation, and I'm joined with Dr. Frank Turek. Um, Frank, I just want to say thanks for coming on the podcast and the video cast. It is an honor and a privilege to have you here. Chip, my pleasure, my honor. Let's go. What are we going to okay, talk okay. about? Okay. Well, we, okay. So let me give you the let me give you the background of what we are doing here with this uh, podcast video cast. Mm-hmm. Um, as, as Grace grew, and of course you've been here yeah, for the weekend. It's really um, it, it has been crazy. Um, I started to realize that not everybody has the same experiences that we've had, you mm-hmm. know, and and I know a lot of people that are pastoring churches that are struggling, and especially now post COVID, just just stuff is tough. I mean, you talk to pastors and they're running at thirty to fifty percent of what they were running. Some of those pastors have to do everything; they don't have a multi, you oh, know, know. S- yeah. s- you know, staff to church. Um, you know, they're they're praying, they love God, they visit the people, but they just have a, sh- a tough time. And I just said, you know, I want to do something to help those pastors, those leaders in their ministry that helps them, you know. And so the, the idea was to give some, you know, sermon helps, to give some theological help, um, to give some technological help. But one of the things that I wanted to do, and it's why you're here, is um, pastors in America are having to struggle with something that they've not, I mean, we've always had it, but not at the levels that we're seeing today, mm-hmm. which is people that are leaving the church and they're saying they're deconstructing their right. faith. They're, right. they're, they're walking away. You know, they say they couldn't agree with something here. They read the Bible and didn't make sense. Or they watched a YouTube video, whatever it may be. You know, and if I'm a pastor, if I'm a leader that maybe didn't get a degree in apologetics or maybe hasn't spent a whole lot of time in that, um, what can what can we do to help them? Like, I mean, imagine if we had a thousand pastors and leaders right here in front of us that that are struggling with some of the people, you know, questioning things about their faith, questioning things about the Bible, questioning things about God. Um, and again, I just want you to feel free to share your heart. What, what are some things a pastor and leader can do to maybe help stave off some of that deconstruction? I think oh, asking questions is actually okay. even better sometimes than making statements. One question I ask people on a college campus, because okay. we do a lot of work on sure college you. campuses, we do I don't have enough faith, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist presentations, and then we take questions. And if I if an atheist gets up to the microphone chip or a skeptic of some okay. kind and expresses any hostility at all. I will normally say, if Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? And I've had atheists stand at the microphone in front of hundreds of people and say, no. And I'd say, no. I thought you claimed to be reasonable. How is it reasonable that you wouldn't believe something that was true? Well, it's not a matter of reason. It's not a matter of the head. It's a matter of the heart. They're not on a truth quest. They're on a happiness quest. And they're just going to believe whatever they think is going to make them happy. Now, here's the problem. We all know, and those viewers out there who are over 40 knows that they, they know this is true, that you can make yourself happy over the short term doing a lot of fun things, but over the long term, it's a disaster. Mm-hmm. The only way to get true contentment is to go straight through truth, and Jesus is the truth. Right. So I would start by asking my congregation or people that I know personally, okay. if Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? Or if you want to take Christianity out of it because it has a negative connotation in some some people's minds, you could say, If Jesus rose from the dead to prove he was God, would you follow him? Now, if people hesitate or say no, the problem's not intellectual, it's volitional. It's not in the head, it's the heart. It's not about about God's existence, it's about their resistance. Mm. They don't want it to be true because they want to be God of their own lives. You see, this is the issue. I think, and you and I were talking about this earlier, Chip, and you can riff on this concept (laughs) because I know you talk about it all the time, and that is the biggest problem in America is not pain and suffering as as big as that problem is. The biggest problem is prosperity. Yes. We don't know what to do with prosperity. We think more prosperity is going to somehow fill the hole in our hearts, and it won't. Mm. Now, I'd rather be prosperous than poor, don't get me wrong. But people think if I just get more and more prosperity, sometimes my life's going to suddenly be better and great and perfect. It's not. Yeah, money doesn't buy happiness. No, no. Um, So... Let's 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 continue to to talk about that. So we get somebody in a church. Pastors got you know people in their church, and somebody comes into the office and says, "I'm really questioning my faith." First mm-hmm. thing to do is to ask them the question: Yes, if Christianity is true, would you believe it? Right. If Jesus had risen from the dead, and if they say yes, that is true, then you feel like we have somebody who's at least 
potentially someone that we can reason with is open. about, about yeah. Christianity. And what would you what would you say to a pastor or a leader um, who maybe is not as well versed in apologetics mm-hmm. or not as well versed in defending their faith? Mm-hmm. You know, um, uh, a lot of times pastors they they know how to preach a text, they know how to visit somebody. But when they're asked questions that are tough questions, sometimes right. they, they they freeze up. Right. One of my friends always says, um, "Tell them they don't have to be an answer giver; they just need to be an answer finder." I uh-huh. love that phrase because uh-huh. we can all go, "Okay, you know what? I'll get back That's to you right. on that." W- what would you say to a pastor or a leader that has got someone who's struggling with their faith that seems to be reasonable? In other mm-hmm. words, that there are there some things that you could give to them, somebody listening right now a couple of things that would really make sense to somebody who's reasonably looking for for truth about Christianity it would, itself. Yeah, my question to them would be, why are you not a Christian right now? What what is holding you back? Mm. What answer do you need if it's a if it's an intellectual yep. issue? And then go from there. Now we have so many resources, free resources on our YouTube channel, crossexamine.org. Please, please go to crossexamine.org. Check it out. Yeah. Tons of great stuff. On our YouTube channel, just cross examine or our website, crossexamine.org. Okay. And of course, I co wrote a book called I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, which takes people from ground zero, people who don't even believe truth exists, all the way to the Bible's the Word of God. So they can get that resource. There are DVDs, curriculum, workbooks okay. they can get there. And they can see a lot of those presentations for free at crossexamine.org YouTube channel. Okay. Uh, so that might be a place to start if it's an intellectual issue. Uh, but there are a lot of issues that are not intellectual. Mm. They're emotional. They're yeah. volitional. You know, they've been wronged by somebody in the church. Yep. Uh, they had a bad experience as a child with the church. Their mother was uh, an overbearing helicopter parent. And she was a Christian, mm. and they're just trying to get away from gotcha. that kind of thing. Those are emotional. They're not intellectual. And for that, I think it takes really building a relationship. But talking about those issues, talking about issues from the pulpit, I think you can fold questions, just like Paul folds. How, how many questions does Paul fold into Romans? Yeah. I mean, it's just one question after another, right? Correct. And then there he answers them as yep. they go. There's a skeptic in the book of Romans. And I think when we preach, I know you preach this way, I try to do, you put questions in the preaching Correct. and then you answer them. Questions yeah. that people have. What do you, in, in, as you tour around, I mean, could you, I mean, you're like on ground zero because you go to college campuses. I mean, these are the guys that are asking and girls that are asking mm-hmm. the ground zero questions. What are the top three, top five? I, I don't, I don't have like a numeration yeah, that I want to yeah. do. But what are the questions that you see are the struggles that people have with Christianity? Are there, are there, are, are there, is, are there not? Is it like, man, it's just a disparate set? It no, could be no, there is a or, set. Is there, is there a set? Oh yeah, the, I would say seventy percent of the questions that we get are related to morality, easily. Really? Oh yeah. Morality? Morality, yeah. Okay. Well, like the moral argument, your favorite argument, my favorite argument for God, you know, there's gotta be a standard beyond us to say anything's right or wrong. If not, everything's just a matter of opinion. And we know it's not just a matter of opinion that murder is wrong. I mean, it's really wrong, right? Yes. So there must be a standard of right beyond us that we're obligated to follow, and that would be God's nature. But uh, here are questions you get on a college campus, they're all related to morality. Um, why did God kill the Canaanites, right? Uh, what about slavery in the Old Testament, right? It's okay. not its not the kind of slavery we think of, but sure, still. Sure. Um, what does God have against uh, homosexual behavior, right? Uh, these are the questions. Even a question like, what about those that have never heard? It's actually a moral question, if you think mm. about it, because what it's, it's implying is that God is somehow immoral if he doesn't get his gospel to every living human being. Right, so it okay. turns out to be a moral question. It's questioning the morality of the Christian God. Gotcha. Okay. Even if God, why evil, is a moral question. Correct. Why does God allow evil to exist? So morality dominates really the questions that you get. And here's, the, I think, the way to handle these questions. No, please, this is what I want. Yeah, is always address the assumption behind the question. So if someone says, "Well, what about killing the Canaanites?" Okay. My first question, why would killing anybody be wrong? Why, why do you think that's wrong? What moral standard are you mm-hmm. using in order to judge the God of the Old Testament for killing Canaanites? And then we go from there. Did God kill the Canaanites indiscriminately? Or was it genocide or was it judgment? And what were they doing that caused God to want to do that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, on, the, on the sex issues, right? You ask, by what standard are you saying that it would be wrong for God to restrict certain sexual behaviors. Why do you think that's wrong for God to do that? Do you think there are any sexual behaviors that ought to be restricted? That's a great point. That's what I would ask too. Yeah. 
And by what standard are you making that? Correct. Right? Because even if you were to say, well, you know, pedophilia is wrong. Why is it wrong? Who said? Is that just your opinion? Or are you appealing to a standard beyond? Whatever consenting adults do. Why is that the standard? Who said? Where, where are you getting the standard from? And so before someone is going to accept your worldview, they need to begin to doubt their worldview first. And so what you do is you ask questions of people mm. to try and get them to support their worldview before you try and give them your worldview. That's great. Yeah. Last night we were having dinner and you said something that was so profound and it goes to this question of sexuality because mm -hmm. you had said that was a really big mm -hmm. deal. You, uh, you were in a debate with some people mm -hmm. and it was, it was on something about love. Right. And, and the thing that you said that was so, um, it was, I mean, I went home and I was like, wow, that's a great point, is you, you asked the question, does love demand approval? Right. Will you, will you explain that? I mean, sure. again, I, I, want, I want listeners to hear this because you know as well as I do, Christianity in America has so many different flavors that people mm -hmm. are hearing from. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that, you know, we think of Jesus, um, we think of him as, you know, love your enemies, turn the other cheek, mm -hmm. and, and all those things are are very true of Jesus. Mm -hmm. But somehow, then that gets that gets taken as if the love of Jesus is just sort of almost like you know a teddy bear. Right. Um, you know, there's there's no right or wrong. There's no mm -hmm. you know, and I, and I I made and I said it to you last night too as well. But I say it frequently from the pulpit. The the cherubim and seraphim don't sound, you know cir circle the throne of God singing love love love. Right, they right. say holy holy right. holy. There is a holiness standard, but th that what. Talk a little bit about that debate you were in and how you, because that, that was marvelous the way you talked about sure. love and approval and what you did. Yeah, my, my friend, Dr. Michael Brown, Messianic okay. Jewish man who's written a, a, a number of great books okay. and has a radio program. He and I were debating two people from the LGBT community at our seminary, Southern Evangelical Seminary okay. in Charlotte, ses.edu. And uh, you might be able to find this on the internet. The, the, the debate was called something like, does love require affirmation and approval? And of course, they were saying yes. The LGBTQ okay. people were saying yes. In order to love people, you have to approve of them. And of course, we were saying no, you can love people without approving them. So at one point in the debate, I turned to them and I said, uh, do you love us? And they said, yes. And I said, do you approve of our position? And they said, no. I said, well, you just lost the debate then because <laughs> that's our position, that you can love people without approving what they do. And that's the point. Love does not require approval. And every parent knows this. Every parent this is great. knows that if you approve of everything your child wants to do, you're not loving, you're unloving. You're enabling them to do evil. If you wanna love somebody, you need to stand in the way of evil because love seeks what's best for the other person. And if you don't seek what's best for the other person, if, then you're just enabling them. Sure. You know, I love what Thomas Sowell said about this, Chip. He's a, the economist that's now about 91 years old, brilliant guy. Um, he said this, he said, when you tell somebody what they need to hear, you're helping them. When you tell somebody what they want to hear, you're helping yourself. That's awesome. You know, he said that. Why? Because why don't we tell people in a graceful way that what they're about to do is going to hurt them or others? Because we don't want to face the consternation that they're going to give back to us when we call them out on their sin. So what are we doing when we say, oh, yeah, I love you. you. Whatever you want to do is fine with me. What We're enabling them when we do that That's right. rather than standing in the gap and saying, I love you so much, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand in the way of evil. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you the truth because right. you deserve the truth Sure, because I love you. We're helping ourselves by telling them what they want to hear. And that doesn't mean that there's not been pastors or Christians that haven't taken the, we don't have to approve of something to show love, that haven't taken that and used it in a way to beat people up sure. or treat them bad. Yeah. But but you can't, that's the that's the struggle that I have so much when I talk with you know, younger people today is you know everything, oh, everybody's out to judge, everybody's out to give a hard time and whatever. And th there are instances where that is in fact true, but I feel so often that Christianity um, it, it, people see Christianity, they see me maybe taking somebody and dragging them out of a house, mm -hmm. and they go, look at that guy, he's unloving, he doesn't care. Mm -hmm. They didn't see the fire that was in the kitchen right. that, yeah. was, that was about to take this guy's That's life. Right. They only see a part of what it is. I mean, mm -hmm. true, genuine love mm -hmm. grabs somebody out of the fire mm -hmm. and, 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 and pulls them, you know, and, and, and for some reason that just, I, I don't know why, but that just doesn't fly in today's, and, and I, don't, I don't wanna saddle that to just the younger generation, it, it, may, it may be in all generations, um, what can we do to counteract that? How can we how can we help? You know, I'm, I'm thinking of a pastor or leader who's maybe going, you know, Frank, um, 
my church skews old. Mm. And I want to reach the younger generation. Mm. And that older generation loves it when I get up and pound the pulpit and tell them what the truth is. Mm -hmm. These younger people come in and go, oh, I don't want to hear all that. Is there is there some way, in, in, in there, I, I don't know, I'm just asking, is there some way mm. we can bridge the gap? Is there any way at all to, to reach that next generation? Because, I mean, I'm of the opinion that the, the youth of America, they want authenticity. They do, yeah. Um, I, I think that, I, I, I tell, when I, I don't do a lot of marriage counseling anymore, but... Um, I used to say it's not what you said; it's what it's the way you said it. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes that it's not what we said; it's the way we said it. Right. Any thoughts on that? Well, I think people. I think calling it out directly, like you just did there, is a way of saying it. Because I'm about to say something that maybe some of you older people are going to go, "Yeah," and some of you younger people may go, "No, I don't. I, th I think that's too harsh." Let me try and explain what I'm trying to say here: that in order to love somebody, sometimes you have to tell them that they're about to get into big trouble. And if you don't do that, you're unloving. Now, if you're thinking that's all judgmental, you're doing the same thing. You're claiming, you're judging me. That's awesome. Right? Yes. You're doing the same thing that you don't want done. Yeah. In fact, you could put it this way. And Tim Keller, I don't know if you're Tim Keller, the former Tim, pastor yes. in New York, He's great. he was so good at this when he was preaching all the time because he lived in New York and he had so many skeptics in his church. Sure. So he was kind of an intellectual pastor to a skeptical generation. Mm. And he would say things like, and I'm paraphrasing, I don't have him remembered uh, verbatim, but he would say things like, um, if uh, no matter which side of the aisle you're on, theologically, if you're right or left, mm -hmm. you know, if you're right, you may think, oh, all those liberals on the left, you know, they're, they're just sinners and sure. all this. And then if you're on the left, you're looking at all the people who are conservative, you're going, those judgmental bigots, right? You know, guess what? Both sides are being judgmental and narrow-minded, no matter which side you're on. That's right. You're being self-righteous by saying, well, at least I'm not like the liberals. Well, at least I'm not like the conservatives, Yeah. right? Sure. You're being judgmental. You're, you're doing exactly what you say is wrong with the other side. That's right. <laughs> you're being yes. judgmental, yes. right? Yes. So Jesus somehow was able to demonstrate both grace and truth. Yes. And we need to keep that in mind. I think one way we can do it is just to call it out directly when we're doing it. Mm. You know, you might think I'm being judgmental right now, but as soon as you say I'm being judgmental, what are you doing? You're being judgmental sure. on my approach. Sure. Right? But isn't that why it's so important for us? I mean, you know, going back to the moral argument, and if, if mm -hmm. you're not quite aware of the moral argument, it's where do we get morality from? If there is no God at all, then we really can't say anything is right or wrong. No, we're, just we're everyone's just, We're opinion. random atoms. Yeah. You couldn't say Hitler, what he did nope. was wrong. None of that. So everybody has a standard of morality. Mm -hmm. even, even, even those who go, I'll let anybody do whatever they want to do until you do it to them, then they say, hey, that's right. wrong. I mean, right. like, everybody knows there's something wrong. Mm -hmm. Like, where does that come from? I think that's why, for me, and I, and I try to say this to all of the students that I teach, I, I'm, in, in the classes that I'm doing on reaching the next generation, it's, it's the sort of just the foundational thing of what I do. If you're teaching the text, and, 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 I, and I say this to the congregation all the time, like, you, you don't need to get mad at me. This is, this is what Paul said. Right. This is what Luke said. Right. Under the inspiration of the mm -hmm. Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. this is what Scripture says. I, I'm not trying mm -hmm. to tell you how to live your life. I'm not trying to judge you. I'm not trying to give you a hard time. I'm going, this is God's truth. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and I think appealing to that, if somebody's being reasonable, if they go, okay, this person believes there's a God, that they, they come to that conclusion because there's a lot of demonstrable reasons to believe that there is a God. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they're saying, God, if he's the if he's the God, creator God, he gets to make the rules. Like when we opened up the Monopoly game, you know, when we were kids, we didn't go, no, 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 no. We're not going to use these cards and mm -hmm. we're not going to use this money. No, you played the game according to the rules. Mm -hmm. You didn't make the Monopoly game. You right. didn't get to choose what, I know some of us like to put some money under the thing and put, you know, <laughs> you know but, but, but we're, we're sinners, you know, uh -huh. <laughs> which proves our depravity. But, but, uh, but the point is, is that God has created certain things and he knows us way more than we know ourselves. Mm -hmm. And what he says is that what I want for you is good. You know, it's so hard to get people to understand we're not being judgmental and nasty well, you know when what? we're trying to help people out. I think out. maybe a way of putting this, Chip, is that what God's commands are, they're not there to take away our joy. They're there to protect us as as guardrails protect That's us right. on a highway. That's awesome. Right? Yes. Uh, because all freedom requires restraint. Hmm. Uh, if I want to, you know, drive from here to Fort Myers 
If I stay between the lines and obey the laws, chances are I'll get there. But if I start going between the lines or off the road or into the yep. swamp, I'm not going to make it. Those lines are there for my protection. Yeah. And if I want to have the freedom of going to Fort Myers, then I have to ensure that I obey the restraints that keep me from danger. Mm. You see, freedom too requires restraints from danger. And that's what restraints are about. That's that's perfect. Yeah. Um, so I'm a pastor. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you say the moral stuff is the stuff that Every, is, is, yeah, is, seventy percent of the questions. Is, is there is there morality. anything is uh um are, are we is people still really um, spun up about creation and in the world? Yeah, but like not that? as much as they used to be. The, okay. the moral issues have taken over. Have campus, they really? Okay, as you can. And is, it, and is it is it really primarily? And I'm not trying to like yeah. focus on. Is it really primarily um, homosexuality? And, and transgenderism. Like transgenderism. Yeah, sure. The sexual so, issues and now the race issues are very big. But again, the only. Uh, Chris, the only worldview that is going to protect individual rights and the only worldview that believes that we're all made equally in the sense that we're all created in the image of God is the Christian worldview, right? That's correct. The Muslim worldview doesn't believe that. They're going to impose Sharia law on people. And if you're not a Muslim, then you don't have the same rights as a Muslim has. The Hindu worldview has a caste system. So yes. people are have, have a different pecking order. The atheistic worldview has no way to ground human rights, which means whoever has the most power wins and gets to impose that on everybody else. The only worldview that believes that we're all created in the image of God and we're all equal regardless of our ethnicities, regardless of our talents, regardless of where we come from, is the Christian worldview. And yet that's the one worldview people want to get rid of. Which is crazy. <laughs> yeah. it, it almost seems the things that they're longing for, the things that they're looking for, are really found within Christianity. They are, you know, but it but it does require us to give up ourself. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd, you'd said that a lot of stuff you see on college campuses is about sort of me and, right. and a lot and a lot of Christian. What do you what do you say? It's not Christianity. It's me 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 entity me entity. Okay. Um, what do you say to a pastor or a leader that you know? And I mean, and it's and it's sort of at this point. I mean, not to use a word that's been overused, but it's almost a pandemic in the church itself. We're seeing a lot of people leave mm -hmm. church. Um, myriad of reasons. People mm -hmm. started getting comfortable watching on TV, mm -hmm. all this other stuff. W what do you think? And, and again, this is not necessarily maybe your forte, but what what do you think churches should do? You know, when Frank Turek's sitting around as a Christian, mm -hmm. not just as an apologist, but as a Christian, and says, you know, I think if the churches in America would do these things, and I don't know, I, I'm not really concerned about the number of them. I'm concerned about the content here. What things can churches be doing to keep people from leaving and to also see people come back? Are there some thoughts you have on yeah, that? Yeah, I think Ephesians 4 and Matthew 28 are the two okay. passages here. Ephesians 4, the purpose of the church is to equip the saints to do ministry in addition to worshiping God, right? Yep. And then, of course, the Great Commission to make disciples. He didn't say make believers. He said make disciples of all nations. Well, how do you do that? That takes time. That takes effort. So I think when you get people involved, when they feel like they're part of the family, that's when they're going to say, this one thing I'm not missing is church. Yeah. That's my family. That's right. right. That's my family away from my family. And this is an eternal family. And so if you can get them involved, if you can give them something to do, some responsibility, everyone can use their gift in some way. Because you know, I mean, you've got 2,000 more, more people attending your church. You can't do all the ministry. It'd no. be impossible. It's impossible. It's impossible. It's and impossible. even if someone... If you've got 100 people in your church, it's impossible to do everything. Yeah. You need to equip the saints right. to do ministry. Yeah, I agree. So, I, I often use, and, I, and I, I'm not a real big guy on like words because yeah. I always, when somebody uses a word, I, the first question I usually ask is, what do you mean when you use that word? Uh -huh. um, but but I, for me, words can become important because our minds sort of sort things out categorically. Right. So words that might mean something to somebody else can mean something to me. But for me, um, I always say that when I made the transition in my mind from being just a shepherd to a leader, mm -hmm. it really changed a lot in the church. How? What um, because what, what what happened was, is I, instead of me having to do everything, mm. you know, as the shepherd, I thought it was my job to tend every sheep, tend, oh. attend everything. Oh. And what I realized was, is if I can become a shepherd of other shepherds, mm. what I can do is I can multiply the amount of ministry that gets yes. done at Grace rather than me having to do everything. Because I'm a guy that, I mean, I, I mean, I, if by nature, I would want to sort of have my fingers in everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just, 
you know, it, it, it's not good, bad, and different. It's just the way I'm wired, you know? And, and, and I've had to learn. It's taken a long time. You know, I'm 51 years old. It's taken me a long time to realize, Chip, you can't do everything. Mm-hmm. You know, and you, you tire. There's a, there's a Calvin um, phrase, John Calvin. He says, men tire themselves in pursuit of rest. You know, and mm. and and it, you know, we're, we're always trying to figure out how can I get a little time off, or when we're just so mm. busy mm. that we that we never do. And you know, it, for me, it was having some good men in my life that that said, "Hey, you know what? You you need to you need to calm down. Like you you, you can't run. You know, and you I don't know. I, I may be different than you. Probably some somewhat like me. I'm like, no, I can run the tachometer at the red line all the time, man. I can do this. Give me a Mountain Dew, man, and I can make but it. But not only yeah. that, though, if you do all that, then you're taking away. Oh, taking away from everybody. I know. You're taking away opportunity from other and, people. And, and, I, and I was yeah. that's where I was getting ready yeah. to go. I yeah. realized how selfish yeah. I was. The chip mm-hmm. that's so selfish to not allow other people to do other things mm-hmm. that you feel that you're the only one that can mm-hmm. do it the perfect way. Mm-hmm. We had a thing that we've talked about. We have a thing called um, Music on Main mm. that we do. Um, it's, it's been shut down, obviously, with, with COVID. It should be opening up pretty soon here. Um, when, we, when we started off, it was going out and reaching people and, 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 and doing all these things. Well, the very first time that we set up a table, I remember thinking, this is terrible. So I came in, and I'm like, we got to do something different the next week, and so we, or the next month. And we came out and did something different. Um, and finally, it had grown so big that I couldn't get every generator, every light, uh-huh. everything. And and finally, I had to like give delegate. It, I had to give <laughs> I had to give it to somebody. Okay. And I remember this was this really happened. I walked out one evening, and I was I mean maybe 30, 45 minutes late getting there. And I started looking. I'm like, who put the wires here? Who set this up here? Why? And and as I was walking. Like this still small voice said, hold on, what's more important here? Where the wires were or what the overall agenda mm-hmm. is? Mm-hmm. And I started thinking, okay, kids are still coming. Everybody's smiling. Mm-hmm. Everybody's, the end game is actually getting done. And right. I'm focused on all the little dumb right. stuff right. that I want to control. Right. And, and that was a real breaking point for me. I remember uh-huh. I remember, I sat down and said, you, you just, you got to stop this. Like you can't, <laughs> you can't do this. You know, um, yeah. and, and I, and I, that's what I want to say to some of these pastors that they're, they're good people. Sometimes you just got to realize you can't do it all. You can't. And that's why we have a body. That's exactly right. right. That's why Paul talks about you, the eye can't stay to the that's hand right. or the ear to the foot or whatever. But we're, yeah. but we, but you know yeah. how we are though. We get wired yeah. where, we, where we go. Oh, I agree with that, but we, we don't really let uh, it go. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, we got um, to. There was a, um, I think it was, um, Andy Stanley, I heard say, uh-huh. he said, uh, um, I, it was back when they had kids at home. Yeah. I heard at some some conference he was speaking at. Yeah. Um, he said, uh, I told God, Sandra needs my help at home. I'm giving you 40 hours. You're supposed to build your church anyway. Mm-hmm. I'm not the one building it. Mm-hmm. I'm going to give you 40 hours. I'm going to go home and be the best husband and dad I can mm-hmm. be. That is, I, I, remember, I remember hearing that and I was like, man, that's that's just true. And sometimes that just, when you're a pastor, that rubs at you because you think, I got to do it all. You yeah, know? it goes back to his point about, are you cheating at work? Are you cheating on your family? What You're going to cheat something. Where are you going to cheat? Right? That's so right. there's a lot to do. And I think, I always say the second hardest job in American Christianity is to be the pastor of a church. The hardest job is to be the pastor's wife. <laughs> That's the hardest job. Yes, my wife Mindy will definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, she, she'll probably be giving a like a thumbs up emoji <laughs> or, or or whatever else. So g- going back to the American church, mm-hmm. going back to where we're at, um, are there any other things that you would say to a pastor that's watching this, to a leader that's watching this, that you feel in your heart? Hey, if I could share this with them, if they hear this. This could be something that could help them out in their ministry. Is there any things that you have that... When John the Baptist sent an emissary from prison where he was to Jesus, the emissary said, John is in prison and he wants to know, are you really the Messiah okay. or should yep. we wait for somebody else? Yep. Right. Now, this is John the Baptist. I know. Baptized Jesus and See, knew this he is was the Lamb, Lamb of God, of God who right. comes away. He's having doubts. He's in yes. prison now. Yep. Now, what did Jesus say back? He said... You go tell John to stop doubting and just have faith. No, he didn't say that. What did he say? He said, look at the signs. Look at the evidence. Basically, he's saying, here's the evidence I'm the Messiah. Yes, I am the Messiah. So when people come to you with doubts, you need to give them evidence. Don't just say, don't ask questions like that. Don't have faith or, or just have faith. Sure. No. 
we have to show people why it's reasonable to be a Christian. It's more reasonable to be a Christian than anything else. That's why I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. <laughs> so 50, 60, 70 years ago, in most places in America, you could just open the Bible and people would go, oh, the Bible, what does it say? Now you open the Bible, they start calling you names, right? You're a bigot, you're a homophobe, you're whatever, right? Mm -hmm. You're intolerant. You have to give people reasons why it's true. Yeah. Not only will it help them evangelize other people because then they'll be equipped with reasons, it will help them when they go through difficulty. Because the truth of Christianity is not in our psychology. You know, when people come to me and they say, hey, Chip, or they say, Frank. Um, well, Chip, you grew up as yeah, a Chip. Yeah, I grew up as a Chip, too, so they could say that. <laughs> you might not know yeah, this, yeah. but Frank grew up in his household as a Chip. That's right, because my dad was Frank, my grandfather was Frank, so I was known as Chip, too. So when they come up to me and they say, um, you know, Frank, I used to be a Christian, but I lost my faith. I'm an atheist now. You know what I want to say to them? I, I don't mean to be unkind, but since I'm originally from New Jersey, sometimes I am. What I want to say to them is, so? So, are you telling me because your psychology changed that God has popped out of existence? Are you telling me because your psychology changed, Jesus didn't rise from the dead? Your psychology has nothing to do with whether or not God exists or Jesus rose from the dead. In fact, your psychology is not gonna tell you whether anything's true. Your psychology is not gonna tell you whether or not airplane travel is the safest way to travel. Yet a lot of people are afraid to get on an airplane. Why? Because psychologically they're worried about it. Mm. But the reality is it's the safest way to go. That's so right. your psychology is not going to tell you whether or not Christianity is true. The evidence will. Your experience, your emotional experience is not going to tell you whether it's true. The evidence will. The reason I'm a Christian is because it's true. And I think what we need to do is we need to give people evidence that it's true. And once the evidence is there, no matter how much your life goes up and down, no matter how much uh, psychological doubt you may have, if you have the evidence, you know it's true and you can cling to that. That's great. What would you say to somebody who's watching right now, they just flipped in mm -hmm. and they're not a believer mm -hmm. at all in mm -hmm. any way, shape or form? What is the Frank Turek go-to, here's the best evidence for that, that, that I go back to, like if you're having, I don't know if you have ever any struggles mm -hmm. or doubts, we, we all do something. What, do, you, do you go back to one thing or is it a myriad of things? Well, it's a myriad of things, but again, I would ask the question, if Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? See what they say, right? Because a lot of times they don't want to be. No matter what you say, they're okay. going gonna to say no. But a good question to ask people is, if there is no God, why is there something rather than nothing? In other words, if there is no God, why does anything exist? Hmm. Because everything that we know exists here in the physical world had a beginning. That's right. So there must be a cause outside of the physical world, a spaceless, timeless, immaterial cause right. that brought it all into existence. And that's what we mean by God. So you got to go back to the beginning. That's good. And, uh, and then I would ask them, is there anything really right or wrong in the world? Is there anything wrong? You know, believe it or not, many college kids are hesitant to say there's anything wrong. Really? Oh, yeah. They but would, but they, if somebody took something out of their bag, they'd go, that's wrong? No, they would say, well, maybe wrong for me, but not for you. That's really the kind of stuff they're really? saying now. Yeah. I mean, this, th this goes back to, uh, what's this, uh, Alan Bloom, who 40 years ago wrote a book, he was University of Chicago, wrote a book called The Closing of the American Mind. And he said this 40 years ago. He said, if there's one thing that you can be absolutely sure of, is that most college students will believe in moral relativism. That it's absolutely true, all relatives are moral. Or, 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 or all morals are relative. Sure, okay. That I can't say that it's really wrong. And a friend of mine just went to Georgia Tech and he really pushed all the kids' buttons. He said, is it wrong to say lynch homosexuals for fun? And they wouldn't say yes. Really? Yeah. They didn't want to say yes because there's only, there's one thing that, there's one thing wrong in our culture right now that you can't do. You can't say anyone's wrong. It's wrong to say anyone's wrong. That's where our culture is right now. It's wrong to say anyone's wrong. Of course, they would say we're wrong for saying other people are wrong. So it's a self-defeating proposition, sure. quite obviously. Sure. And as you pointed out before, Chip, when people say, don't impose your morality on me, I say, this isn't my morality. I didn't make this stuff that's up, right, that's right? right? I didn't make up the fact murder is wrong, rape is wrong, theft is wrong, abortion is wrong, no. men were made for women, women were made for men. I didn't make any of this stuff up. That's this right. isn't my morality. This just happens to be the morality. That's right. It's self-evident that Thomas Jefferson said that. And of course, Apostle Paul says it's written on our hearts in Romans sure. chapter two. That's right. We know this morality, but we don't like it sometimes. So I say, look, if you have a problem with the morality, you don't have a problem with me. You have a problem with 
uh, the creator upon whose nature this morality is derived. Sure. So that's why I like your tactic to say, in fact, my friend Greg Kokel, who wrote the book Tactics, says this tactic he calls, what a friend we have in Jesus. What's the tactic? When somebody says, what do you think about a controversial issue? What do you think about same-sex marriage? You say, it doesn't matter what I think about it. What it matters is what Jesus thought about it. And here's what Jesus thought marriage was. It was between a man and a woman. Mm. He says this in Matthew 19. Uh, what about Jesus and sexual immorality? Jesus said that it's not what goes into a man that makes him unclean. It's what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. Mm. Theft, murder, sexual immorality. What was sexual immorality in his day? Anything outside of marriage between a man and a woman. Exactly. Sex. So Jesus is the one who says that this is a problem. Mm -hmm. He's putting up guardrails for you. That's right to protect you from harm. That's right. And if you want to blow through the guardrails, there's going to be consequences. And, and, and if we, and, and, I, and I'm just trying to be honest, we look at society today mm -hmm. and we've blown through guardrails. Oh, totally. And how are we doing? Yeah, awfully, yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. I mean we, haven't, we haven't found utopia. No. Another question, because this is so big and you're great at this. There is a whole movement in the churches today that's labeled, and, and again, I, it may have different labels, but typically labeled as progressive mm. Christianity. Mm. Um, and it is it is sweeping through mm -hmm. um, churches. Uh, any Anything to, to say to that? Because pastors are gonna be confronted with this yes. stuff coming up. You know, the Bible's not really the word of God. And which is interesting, because the very, the very first thing we have in the garden is the old enemy saying, did God really say? Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you think that's just coincidental mm -hmm. that that's there, but you know, the Bible not being the word of God, a reestablishing of all types of morality. What do you say to a pastor or a leader that that may not be completely aware of how big of an issue progressive Christianity mm -hmm. is? Anything you could say to them to help them in their Sure, ministry? there's a friend of mine who wrote a book. Uh, her name is Elisa Childers. She wrote a book called Another Gospel, which is a good book to get on this that's great. about progressive Christianity. That's, um, that's a Galatians 1.6. Yeah, exactly. She's mm -hmm. saying this is another gospel. And what so-called progressive Christians believe is they, and they're not a monolithic group, so I, you understand. may find some variation here, but the Bible is not inerrant. It's not the word of God. Uh, the atonement they have a problem with the atonement. They think the atonement was divine child abuse. Well, if you take the atonement out of Christianity, what do you have? <laughs> Nothing. Nothing, right? It's just another works-based religion, right? Uh, the biblical sexual ethics are out the door. Okay. Any, anybody wants to do sexually, practically, it's just okay, just fine, right? Um, the resurrection, he resurrected maybe metaphorically. So Jesus can resurrect you out of your problems, not that he really rose from the dead. It's not Christianity at all. It's, it's really me -anity. It's all yeah. about me. It's not even progressive. No, that's what I say. It's not progressive or Christian. It's not progressive if you're getting away from Christianity. If you're getting away from Jesus, it's regressive. And it's not Christianity if you're disagreeing with Jesus. Now, why yeah. do people disagree with Jesus and call themselves Christians? In fact, let me ask you this. Let's suppose you and I were at the base of Mount Sinai yep. when Moses comes down okay. with the Ten Commandments chip. Yep. And he, he goes, here are the Ten Commandments. And we look at those ten and we go, you know, Moses, we don't really like those 10. We have our own 10. Should we call ourselves followers of Yahweh? No, no, we're not followers of Yahweh. We're followers of ourselves. So why do people insist on calling themselves Christians when they're disagreeing with Jesus? Because that's what yeah. they're doing. Yeah, well, they, that's, well, that happened at the foot of Sinai, if you want to get technical, because uh -huh. Aaron decides to say this golden you know, uh, calf is, this yeah, is the God yeah. that took you out of Egypt. Right. So they're worshiping another God. Mm -hmm. I mean, Moses is so frustrated, he does throw down the the, the tablets. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, and, and I think that's the, you know, Judges has this cycle all the time. It right. says they did what was right in their own eyes, right, you know? Right. Um, and, I, and I think that, I mean, that's, that's a, at some point as a pastor, you have to decide, do you believe that scripture is the word of God. And I you, think you can you show have. the evidence that it is. I do That's too. the yes. thing. That's what we do in the book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. And you have, I mean, you have plenty of yeah. listeners, if you want to talk about any of these things, go to cross-examine, right? Let me say one other thing, because you brought something up I want to, I want to marinate okay. on for a minute. And then you said the original lie is, has God said? Yes. Right? That is the original lie. Yes. You know what I think is kind of underneath that though? Basically what Satan was saying is, you will not be happy if you obey God. That's really what this is all about, isn't it? Yeah. It's not about truth. It's well, about everybody wants happiness. their best life now. Right. You yeah. Know? It's not about truth. It's about happiness. How can I get happy? That's what I want. I'm not on a truth quest. I'm on a happiness quest. And there's a way that seems right to a man, but its way ends in death. death. And in case you missed it in Proverbs 14, 12, mm -hmm. they repeat it again in Proverbs 16, 25. They did. Just in case, you, just in case yeah. you missed it. Yeah. A couple yeah. chapters later, we'll say it again. Yeah. And, and you would expect that if this world is 
Satan's world, you would expect things to look attractive that actually are going to be harmful. That's right. You would expect that. Yes. And that's what we have. But we don't. Though that that I mean, we're so we're so blinded. I'm yeah. not talking about everybody, yeah. but I'm saying the world is so blinded. They're going for the attractive stuff. But everybody knows this. Everybody knows if I could just have that car, I yeah. would be happy. I if I could have, just have that, house, just and they get it. it. Yeah. And as soon as they get yeah. it, guess what? Yeah. It's the next thing that's going right. to make them happy. Right. Like it's there's almost like this. Um, Augustine said it was like the hole in our heart. Uh-huh. You know, it's like we're searching so much right. for all of this stuff. And I mean, the answer to that. Is, is a relationship with Jesus. You know, my friend Jay Warner Wallace, he's a cold case homicide detective. He's okay. written a book called Cold Case Christianity where he took his, his detective skills and applied them to the greatest homicide of all time, the homicide of Jesus. Okay. And it's called Cold Case Christianity. Okay. Anyway, Jim says that when he finds a dead body that he knows has been murdered, he says there's only three reasons why that guy's dead. It's not a thousand reasons. It's just three or one of these three or a combination thereof. There was either a sex issue, a money issue, or a power issue. Sex, money, and power. Those are the three universal motivators Hmm. that cause us to sin. Sex, money, and power are good things, but they're so good, we'll sometimes take shortcuts to get them. Hmm. And that's why we sin, not just murder, but any sin. We're trying to get those three things or variations of those three things. Sex, money, and power. This is why the Proverbs spend so much time on these Hmm. issues, right? Because they know those are the universal motivators that can cause us to blow through the guardrails. And when we blow through the guardrails, we're not only hurting ourselves, but we're hurting other people exactly along right. with it yes. and distancing ourselves from God. And so sex, money, and power are the three things we have to watch out for because they are so powerful. They're so good, but that means they're also so dangerous because they are so good. They sure. can cause us to do crazy things. That's right. That's great. And um, I think that those three issues are also issues that show why we know the New Testament writers are telling the truth. You say, how can that be? Because all of the writers of the New Testament, with the exception of Luke, all of them were Jewish believers in Yahweh, right? They thought they were God's chosen people. They didn't think that somebody could rise from the dead in the middle of time. They thought somebody would rise from the dead. We'd all rise at the end of time, Daniel 12 too. And they didn't think somebody could claim to be God. That would be blasphemy. So my question is, why would these Jewish believers in Yahweh invent a resurrected Jesus who claimed to be God and then get beaten, tortured, and killed for claiming this was true if it wasn't true? Did they get sex for saying this was true? No. Did they get money for saying it was true? No. Did they get power for saying it was true? No, they got the opposite. They got persecuted, right? Paul had the power before he became a Christian. That's right. And then he got persecuted. There is absolutely no motive for the New Testament writers to invent the New Testament story because sex, money, and power had nothing to do with it. In fact, it was the opposite. They got abused and ultimately killed for saying this was true. And that's, at the end of the day, that is the, um, it's what Christianity hinges on, is whether or not Jesus got up from there. Exactly, here's the way to say it, I think, sometimes, just to clarify everything, is this. The New Testament writers did not create the resurrection. The resurrection created the New Testament writers. That's right. You you wouldn't have a New Testament written by Jews in the first century unless Jesus rose. Well, there were plenty of messiahs that came before Jesus and after. And when they died, they went on to another one. Nobody uh-huh. ever said, "Hey, let's get the band back together and let's and let's <laughs> and let's hang out a little bit and talk about this and write all this stuff down." Uh-huh. A, a, a crucified Messiah was a failed Messiah every time, right. every place. So knowing, I mean, like you don't even have to be biblical here. This is just the way the culture was. Somebody got hung on a cross, done under God's you, curse. You, you moved absolutely. Deuteronomy 21. So what yeah. in the world happened that Jesus? And and we know they were all in hiding. I mean, which is right. exactly what they would have done because. They're fit thinking they're going to come after us too because this is what they do to people uh-huh. that claim to be the Messiah. Rome knew the whole story. I mean, they knew they thought somebody's going to come along and overthrow Rome. So oh, yeah. the best way to do it, hey, there's your guy on the cross. He and, he and the guy. So what in the world happened for, oh, and I, I always joke too, like James, like what would it take for you to think that your brother That's was right. God? That's like, right. What, what happened? Um, maybe <laughs> resurrection from the dead, uh-huh. you know? And, uh, you know, it's cool too how Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, he's like, so let me tell you, this guy here, this guy here, oh, there's 500. You know what? And most of them are still alive. You can go talk to them. That's right. I mean, that's that's not somebody who's trying. And that's that's 52 AD. You're talking mm-hmm. 20 years after. And, 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 and of course, that, that's when he wrote. But we're talking within 10 years after, you know, Jesus dies, we're starting to get fragments of stuff. I mean, the early church's message was this guy got up from the grave. Yeah, totally. Yeah. You know, and, and, and the, the evidence is so overwhelming mm-hmm. for the resurrection 
that in my mind, once once that's true, if Jesus is truly resurrected, then right. the other and, stuff is just- In fact, there's only two things ultimately we try and show to college kids. Uh, the two main points are God exists and Jesus rose from the dead. If that's true, everything else falls into place, Chip. That's right. Because you know? if Jesus rose from the dead, he's God, and whatever God teaches is true, Jesus taught the entire Old Testament as the word of God, and he promised the New Testament. That's right. That's why I believe the Bible's the word of God, not because I can answer everything in there, but because Jesus believed it was true. Look, I just have a personal policy. If somebody rises from the dead, I just trust whatever the guy says, okay? <laughs> and Jesus <laughs> rose funny. from the dead. So last thing here, mm-hmm. and, and I will we'll, we'll wrap this up. We'll do this again, though. Okay, okay. good. Um, if there's a pastor, a leader, a mm-hmm. Christian that's watching, mm-hmm. they're struggling, mm-hmm. you know, they're just, it's a tough time. Yeah. You know, is there anything, you know, because they, they may actually be watching this only because they go, I've heard that name Frank Turek before. They may mm. just tuned in because of a name mm. that they heard or whatever. Is there anything that you could say to them pastorally, you know, mm. um, uh, is from a caring standpoint to a Christian or leader who's just really going through a difficult time right now to encourage them? You know, when I go through difficulty, what I love to go to are the Psalms. Okay. Because the Psalms are cathartic. And the Psalms, you know, most of the Bible is God speaking to us. The Psalms are us speaking to God. Sure. And you look at some Psalms, I want to say it's Psalm 44. Here's Psalm 44, the psalmist is going, God, we're not even in sin and all this bad stuff's happening. Why is it? Where are you? Mm -hmm. I think going to the Psalms is the place to go when you go through difficulty like this. I also think fellowship with other pastors. Mm. And I know you're trying to foster fellowship with other pastors. Yes, I think that's important because it's a very lonely job, pastorate. It's just very lonely. It's like being a CEO of a company. Who can you who can you talk to without someone yeah. having some sort of yeah. angle on you That's that right. isn't just a friend? You know what I mean? That's right. And so I think it's difficult, and uh, I think that you need you need some people that you can trust who maybe are even outside of the church that that's right. you can just I think that's I think that's key. I think that, I think with. for pastors to really have real relationships unfortunately mm-hmm. many times it has to come from people that are outside of the church. Yeah. Because if you're so real to somebody in the church right. sometimes that gets taken and you know Yeah, that turns know, into a prayer yeah. request at the next, at the next yes, prayer but, meeting, well, right? But it's but, but it no it's it's called a prayer <laughs> right, request right. but it's it's really gossip, it's gossip you yeah. know. Let me tell you what the pastor's struggling yeah, with now let's yeah, pray. Yeah. You know, uh so so somebody, you know, uh, Psalms, I, I, I think of Psalm 73, where uh, the, the psalmist says that, uh, he says, I know God is good as to, to Israel, but as for me, my um, feet had almost slipped. I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Mm. I saw all the things that were going on until I went to the house of the Lord and I got a recalibration, you know. Th- th- those Psalms are so rich to me because we've all had those moments where we, oh, yeah. and sometimes you just gotta get in the, and I think the house of the Lord is not only scripture, it's, it's fellowship, it's prayer. I mean, I think there's a reason why God wanted us to gather weekly, mm. you know, and, mm. and I think that that's that's one of the things that um, I'm hoping that pastors and leaders will at some point realize through this pandemic, and, and it's a lesson for all of us that watching online, and I'm not opposed to it, I'm not opposed to having stuff on the internet, I'm not opposed, but there is no substitute no. for people gathering together, mm-hmm. worshiping, praying for each other, and loving each other. Mm-hmm. You know? I also want to just shout out for Psalm 103 because that's okay. one of my favorites. It says, um, God's love to those that fear him exceeds the height of the heavens above the earth. Now, how high are the the heavens above the earth? We just spoke about this at church here today. Just very briefly, the number of stars in the universe are about equivalent to the number of grains of sand on all the beaches on all the earth times 100,000. That's what the scientists are telling us. And... It says that God's love exceeds the height of the heavens above the earth. How far apart are these stars, Chip? According to the evidence from our galaxy, the stars are 30 trillion miles apart on average. That would take you, if you could go space shuttle speed at five miles a second, it would take you over 200,000 years just to go from one star to another star. And you're telling me the number of stars in the universe are about equivalent to sand grains on 100,000 Earths? Yeah. So if God's love exceeds the height of the heavens above the earth, and Isaiah tells us, or God speaking through Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 40, you want to know what I'm like? Look to the heavens. And we look to the heavens and we see what's out there. That should give us a sense of awe that allows us to get through any difficulty we're going through. Right. And it's, it's, that, that was just a, a beautiful um, presentation today, Grace. Uh, I, I know I sat back and just 
was just like, wow. You know, the fact that the creator of the universe that knows every star by name, put them all together, didn't create the universe in his image. He created mm-hmm. you and me in his image. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's just, that is so powerful. Mm-hmm. Well, um, Frank, I just want to say thanks for coming on the, the My pleasure, podcast Jim. and the um, video cast. Um, wish you the best and uh, we'll, you, we will sir. do this again. Yeah, looking forward Sounds to it. Great. Thank you. Uh-huh. Hey, Chip here. I just want to take a moment and say thanks so much for, for watching Reaching the Next Generation. Um, I really hope that this was something that was beneficial to you. And what I would ask, if you really enjoyed this, would you like it? Would you subscribe to it? Would you give us some comments? And most importantly, would you share it? Um, I believe with all of my heart that the material and the content that we have on this channel truly can make a difference and resource pastors and leaders and Christians. And you can help us to truly help others to reach the next generation. Thanks so much for being a part of our channel.